Hey friends, great to see you. Last week I talked about what nationalism is and why it's so dangerous. You might want to check out that video so you, you know, so you get a good base of understanding for this video, but you don't need to. Today we're talking about immigration and borders. It's only recently that the people of the world have been forcibly segregated by birth. Now it's become so normal to restrict people's movement across borders, millions of people have been cheering on a Gestapo-like agency for removing people not legally approved for entry into their landmass, and separating families and placing them in concentration camps because they committed a victimless crime. But it doesn't have to be this way. I'm Chris. And this is what had to be said. I won't be spending this video debunking every claim that's ever been made about immigration. There are plenty of places online people have already done that. Just Google something like arguments against immigration. There are answers to every objection you've got. But I don't think it matters because I rarely heard many of those arguments against immigration that have been made in good faith. Like I've heard the same people argue both that immigrants are too different from us so they'll dilute our national identity, you know, from people whose idea of our national identity comes from the words of their favorite politicians, and that immigrants just stick together in their own enclaves and don't assimilate. Well, which is it? I've heard others say that immigrants are taking good jobs away from real Americans, and that immigrants are lazy and go on welfare as soon as they arrive. People who argue like that aren't even trying for principled arguments or logical consistency. They either don't know what they're talking about, or they have other objections that they're not voicing. And it's not just right-wingers. Liberals make it all happen by making the same arguments. And where have these arguments led us? It's now considered normal to trap and round up people who may or may not have crossed the border illegally, separate them from their families, and throw them in cages indefinitely. The U.S. government has been testing the waters recently, seeing how much they can get away with. ICE has been getting away with all kinds of this Gestapo shit, but people have been standing up to them, and that's encouraging. What's discouraging is knowing that it's going to keep happening as long as people are arguing that it's going a bit too far. It's fine to control people's crossing of invisible, arbitrary lines on the map. It's fine to imprison them for breaking the law about entering an enormous landmass that already has millions of people in it. It's normal to expect people to fill out endless forms, go to interviews and pay fees before they're allowed anywhere near me. Even if they're friends of mine and I vouch for them, doesn't matter. Who am I? The state doesn't trust my word. Because the state has power over me. Which is why calling the state a democracy is meaningless, and equally meaningless to think it's your country. You have no power to make changes to it or to sell it. You can't even opt out of it. Neither the government nor the land belongs to you. They belong to a few really rich people who you don't know, but who consumers like you and I give money to all the time. Do you still think it makes sense to trust the state to separate the good people from the bad? If so, why don't you get the police to interview people before they're allowed to move into your neighborhood? Why don't we set up roadblocks between towns and don't let anyone through just in case they turn out to be different from us? 
Is it because there's something inherently less trustworthy about the foreign? Isn't the power to regulate borders just a way to make voters believe that it matters? But now, when children are in cages with no prospect of release until they all die from the flu, now it's a problem. No, all of it is a problem. People are always so busy arguing about what's currently happening, rather than looking for the roots of a problem. Look at the long history of racism in Europe and its colonies. Look at the nationalism that grew alongside it. Look at the history of discrimination against immigrants to the U.S. Look where opposition to immigration to Europe is coming from, from this new brand of fascism gaining ground and going mainstream instead of getting crushed under the boots of reasonable people like it should be. More than a thousand people a year die in the Mediterranean trying to get to Europe to seek asylum. People have been arrested for trying to help people get to safety. I see no reason why someone should have the right to restrict other people from entering their favorite part of the world. I mean, maybe if it was your house, I would understand. But an entire country? Where do these magical rights to do violence to others for no reason come from? But because the state does own the country, because it tells us we're a democracy, people think that means they have power. Really, what it means is propaganda will tell them what they want to hear. Why else would anyone think they should have this power? Why else would anyone think it was important to restrict the free flow of people? They've been fed all kinds of arguments for why they should let the state take that power. I used to be able to make those arguments. I just don't believe them anymore. I've also heard people say that it's not just brainwashing, that people aren't just being controlled by propaganda and they're consciously supporting policies that are in their, or at least they see as in their interests. Maybe. But then that would have to mean that their, their interests are opposed to foreigners. So anyone who wasn't born within their lines, how could they know? They don't even know those people. And those same people, you know, they, they tend to be suspicious of non-white people in their country anyway. So it's not surprising all these places like North America, Europe, and Australia are a fair bit more lax about immigration or even just tourist visas from predominantly white countries. And of course, if you're rich, well, we don't really mind where you're from. But that means for most of the people in the world, there's no chance they can go somewhere new to improve their lives. Well, why not? Because you don't want to see them? It's obviously nothing to do with money. If people really cared about wasting money, they would say something about the billions of dollars spent creating and enforcing borders, and the extra arm of tyranny in the form of border police and their unlimited powers over people. But they don't care about throwing money and freedom away. They just don't like immigrants. Country's full. Sorry. They're afraid of cultural and demographic change. You know, that boogeyman of the right wing. They've persuaded the majority, we need to fear the foreign and the brown, just like they do. And they've done it by making up lies. Every day, right wingers tell their followings that illegal immigrants are going on welfare, which is impossible because they're not eligible. Or that illegal immigrants are an invasion because people moving around the world peacefully apparently warrants a military response, but not when it's white people. Learn to recognize their lies. Learn to see systems of violence and oppression for what they are. It's not your system. It doesn't work for you. 
It's not trying to keep you safe or protect your job. Learn to stand in solidarity with oppressed people, if for no other reason than because the more violence the state uses on others, the more it has to use on you. The Guardian recently published a very relevant article that I'd like to take a look at. Just the first two paragraphs of it here. The name of the article is Immigration Panic, How the West Fell for Manufactured Rage. The West is being destroyed not by migrants, but by the fear of migrants. In country after country, the ghosts of the fascists have rematerialized and are sitting in parliaments in Germany, Austria, in Italy. They have successfully convinced their populations that the greatest threat to their nations isn't government tyranny or inequality or climate change, but immigration. And that, to stop this wave of, of migrants, everyone's civil liberties must be curtailed. Surveillance cameras must be installed everywhere. Passports must be produced for the most routine of tasks, like buying a mobile phone. Take a look at Hungary, where Viktor Orban has forced out the Central European University and almost destroyed the country's free press and most other liberal institutions, using immigrants and George Soros as boogeymen. Or Poland, whose ruling party purged the judiciary, banished political opponents from government media, greatly restricted public gatherings and passed a law modified only after an international outcry, making it a crime to accuse Poland of complicity in the Holocaust. Or Austria, where the neo-Nazis in the governing coalition want to fail kindergartners for not knowing German. Or Italy, where a fanatically anti-immigrant coalition that won power is now going after the Roma. All these rode to power, or intensified their grip on it like Orban, by stoking voters' fear of migrants, promising to ban new immigrants and to take away the rights of immigrants already in the country. Once in power, they energetically set about depriving everyone else of their rights, migrants or citizens. And that's what fascists do. The article then goes into the colonial history of nationalism, which I mentioned in my last video, but didn't really go into depth on. So, of course, the link is in the description. And the flow of immigrants and refugees is not going away anytime soon. In the coming years and decades, we're probably going to hear a lot more about climate refugees. A recent UN report, uh, UN report sorry, I'll also link to, uh, talks about the extent of the damage climate change will cause to millions of the world's population. But you don't need to read it. You can imagine what'll happen. Crops will fail more often. Deserts will expand. Aquifers will dry up. People will suffer malnutrition. And they'll die because... People in rich countries won't let them in to where they could go for help. People are worried that letting in refugees will burden public services. The thing is, they contribute at least as much as they take out, at least if they're allowed to. What, all of them are poor peasants with no skills at all? All of them are lazy and they're going to go on welfare? Of course not. The vast majority will want to be productive and contribute. All intergenerational studies on immigrants would tell you that. That the vast majority of immigrants work hard and their kids become assimilated locals. And for all the Americans who talk about the welfare magnet, you must have a pretty poor understanding of how good welfare is in the U.S. Now, I'm still trying hard not to assume anything about everyone who's opposed to throwing open borders. Obviously, they're not all fascists. But if you oppose immigrants for any reason, you're killing people. There. I said it. Borders kill. A lot of people, actually. 
Six people die every day in the Mediterranean, trying to cross into Europe, but they're turned away and they die. Hundreds die every year crossing into the U.S. Asylum seekers get sent back to where they came from and get killed. And all of this violence is getting worse because fascists are killing people in the streets and gaining power in politics, and Border Patrol are even taking on more powers of their own. People who say, you know, oh, if only I had been alive during the Holocaust. Well, now's your chance. Prove that you're willing to help people fleeing for their lives. That people's lives are more important than the terrifying possibility that one of these people will go on welfare. Hey, here's a totally hypothetical trolley problem. Okay? Okay. You could save over a thousand lives a year by throwing the switch, but you would need to let people who don't look like you and don't speak your language live near you. Quite the dilemma, hey? I guess the answer depends on whose lives matter. Here's another one. You could A, shoot a thousand people in the back of the head, or you could B, let them drown in the sea. I think I would choose A, because it would be much less painful and terrifying for the people involved. If your objection to the question is, I'd rather not do either, then we agree. The rich, of course, have no country and face no borders. They don't even have to take their passports with them. They get in their private jets, and they go wherever they want. As one wealth manager interviewed said, the lives of the richest people in the world are so different from those of the rest of us, it's almost literally unimaginable. National borders are nothing to them. They might as well not exist. The laws are nothing to them. They might as well not exist. And it's a sign of how privileged I am that, while I'm, I'm not even rich, but just because of what I look like and where I'm from, I can still get into foreign countries much more easily than my friends from the so-called developing world. Even, even my friends with a similar education and income and everything else. In some places, I don't even need a visa. I just show up, pay a fee, and they give me one. Meanwhile, for my friends, just being from the wrong country means it's much, much harder for them to move. Unless they're rich or just get lucky, they have little chance of leaving their country at all. That's because borders are a global system of apartheid. It's weird to think how normal it is for most people to have militarized borders and complicated immigration laws, when just a century ago there was none of it. The only immigration restrictions the U.S. passed until the middle of the 20th century were the Chinese Exclusion Act, and there, of course, you can see that racism has always been a part of restriction of immigration. And yet, in just the past two generations, Borders have been raised so high, most people can't leave their countries of origin. Those countries are Bantu stands. Every measure of apartheid, like every law, was designed to restrict peaceful, voluntary activity through violence. There was legally enforced segregation by race. The non-white races got the worst land meaning they were confined to where they couldn't be as economically productive, and that kept them stuck in poverty. They were restricted in the housing they could have, the jobs they were allowed, the public spaces they were allowed into, and, of course, 
whom they were allowed to marry. So it's the same as modern-day immigration laws. National, racial, and religious labels still matter, and a person's character does not. Also like apartheid, border control sets state policies and priorities. Huge amounts of money and energy go into policing the bodies of people who are, or just might be, foreign. The undesirables. It means patrols, roadblocks, raids, secret trials, and emergency laws passed to give the state emergency or extraordinary powers. Propaganda needs to keep up, too. In 1950, the government of South Africa passed the Suppression of Communism Act, the same time as the McCarthy trials were going on in the U.S. And, just like in the U.S., it was used to attack the state's enemies. The law actually states that communism aims at disrupting the harmony among races. You know, the racial harmony created by apartheid. Communist theory promotes liberation. Oppressed groups often start reading it. They read it in the segregated U.S. too. The difference between today's border regime and apartheid is there's no international movement against borders. It's taken as just another part of the status quo. But any movement for workers' rights, climate change activism, anti-racist, anti-authoritarian, anti-imperialist, and anti-capitalist movements should all seek to eliminate borders and other restrictions on movement. If you have any serious objections to these things, it's fine. Let's talk about them in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel for more videos just like this one every Saturday. Thanks, everyone.